On April 14, 2016, the Patriots of Captain Bell's Tavern Association gave a presentation of the history of the Bell Tavern. Here to do introductions is Randy Heishman. Uh, what you're here tonight is you're going to hear a little bit of the history of um, Mr. Bell. You're going to hear some history of the tavern. There's been speculation um, by a lot of authoritarians. You're going to hear one tonight who hopefully put everything to rest on any speculation about uh, the building. Um, my aspect of this whole situation is I uh, restored a tavern myself. Um, it is a, a labor of love. Uh, it is a lot of money, it is a lot of time, it is a lot of patience, but what you learn out of all that is that it can be saved along with a lot of other buildings that are in uh, central Pennsylvania who have uh, similar historic uh, values to it. So tonight you're going to hear from three people. You're going to hear from Christine, you're going to hear from Cooper, and you're going to hear from uh, Mr. Kevin Hollowell. Uh, each one of them is going to bring an expertise in the situation. I think uh, you'll enjoy every one of them. So, if I could please uh, get a round of applause for Christine. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it, or we really appreciate it. Um, this is today's um, James Bell Tavern. Uh, it's in sad condition but we're hoping that we're um, going to save it. So, the James Bell Tavern in Silver Springs Township in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, stands upon the Stony Ridge on the north side of the Carlisle Pike. The stone building is bordered by open fields on the east and woods to the north and west. Northeast of the building stands a stone bank barn. Across the road from the from the tavern is a small trailer park. The James Bell Tavern, built prior to 1798, was a two-story, double-pile, five-bay stone dwelling with a gable roof and two end chimneys. A two-story, two-bay, single-pile stone kitchen, L, with tiered porch on the east elevation was built onto the northeast corner around 1870. The original first floor plan of the building featured a central hall with two <coughs> rooms on either side, according to Dolores Sunday, who resided in the building from 1947 to 1954. She, she said the central hall was removed after 1954. The front rooms measured approximately 17 feet by 18 feet, while the smaller rear front rooms measured approximately, oh, um, while the smaller rear parlors measured 13 feet by 18 feet. The original closed um, stair, uh, string staircase featuring a square mule and turned balusters um, remained intact. Also featuring, um, oh, I'm losing my place here, I apologize. Also flanking the fire, uh, also extent were scalloped shelves and cupboards. Flanking the <coughs> fireplace in the southwest corner room and in the northwest corner room. <coughs> According to Mrs. Sunday, the southeast corner room which uses the bar room for the tavern and the imprint of the bar could still be seen during her residence. The 18th century Bell Tavern retained many early architectural details, including its staircase, fireplace, cupboards, and paneled fireplace wall on the second floor. The Stone Bank Barn, dating to the early 19th century, is significant as one of the few stone barns <coughs> still standing along the heavily developed and increasingly developed Harrisburg Carlisle Pike. The building is also historically significant as an 18th century and 19th century tavern. The, Har the, the <coughs> Carlisle Pike was one of the most significant routes to the West during this period. 
Local historian uh, Robert Christ uh, writes about this. So um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and let Cooper share the life, some of the life of uh, um, James Bell. Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? So I wanted to kind of dive into what James Bell, who was he, what was his life like? We do know that James Bell was very fluent in local politics. He was a tavern keeper, dating back to at least about late, late 1760s, on the great road between Harrisburg and Carlisle. In a period of widespread discontent, Bell was in a prime position to hear that discontent, and he understood the varying viewpoints. Bell, as far as we know, was born about 1736-1737 in Lancaster County, the son of John Bell, who was himself the son of an Irish immigrant. Like many of his brothers, he had moved westward to Lancaster County, but unlike his siblings, he settled here in Cumberland County for the rest of his life. Bell set up shop at Stony Ridge sometime in the late 1760s. The details are hazy, and we are still kind of uncovering things day by day, and hopefully in a few months and a year, we can stand before you and have even clearer history of what the Bell Tavern, uh, the history of the Bell Tavern, and of Captain James Bell. Um, one thing to keep in mind, we think a tavern, we think probably um, alcohol is the first thing that comes to our mind. And in that day and age, taverns were a very, they served a civic function. A lot of people would get their mail delivered to taverns. They would walk or they would ride and they would get their mail at a, at a tavern. Uh, there would be debates, there would be meetings as we had here at the Bell Tavern. There would be fights as you can kind of see depicted in that engraving. So a tavern was a really varied community function. Uh, by, in 1771, Bell revealed that he has, quote, for some time past kept a public house uh, as he petitioned the colony for what appears to be a renewal of his tavern license. That is 1771. Uh, in that same year, 1771, if we go to the tax records, we find that James Bell had 40 acres cleared and an additional 200 warranted acres. The warrant system uh, was in Pennsylvania and essentially said that if you had land that you found that was unoccupied, that you squatted on, if you went and quote unquote improved it, which is very ambiguous, might mean chopping down a tree here and there, you could lay claim to the land. So James Bell took advantage of the system and he had 200 warranted acres. Uh, throughout the 1770s, he increased those holdings and by 1776, when the revolution breaks out, he has 337 warranted acres and over 100 acres cleared and ready for use. Uh, James Bell was accompanied at Stony Ridge by his wife, Sarah, and their several children. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Stony Ridge is Ironstone Ridge, we, many of us know today. The Appalachian Trail traverses it. It's um, a little bit west of New Kingston on the Carlisle Pike, heading towards Carlisle. Uh, James Bell was accompanied there by his wife, Sarah, and their several children. In 1762, they had a son named John, and in 1764, they had a son named William. He also had a son named Samuel and a son named Thomas. Thomas would eventually take over the tavern. However, we are still looking for an exact birth date for him. Uh, as a patriarch of, the Bell of this branch of the Bell family, James Bell spent the early 1770s clearing additional acreage. Um, by 1776, he would have three horses, six cattle, and eight sheep. Uh, so it gives you an idea. In that day and age, you were trying to be self-sufficient. So you had a, he had a tavern, he had a business there, and he also had you know, over 100 acres he would farm himself. He tried to make everything he needed for him and his family within their realm, and whatever surplus they had, that would be their income. They, they would have sheep to make wool. I mean, it was a very self-sufficient operation we're talking about here. Now, when it comes to the p political side of James Bell's life, he, as I said, he, he was in a prime position, whether he was participating in those conversations of political nature, whether he was starting them, or whether he was just eavesdropping. There are a lot of people at the tavern, a lot of them are drunk, some of them just kind of little, little uh, buzzed, and they are talking about, um, some of them are loyalists, some of them are um, rabid for independence, some of them are in between. James Bell picks up on this. So it's hard to tell whether the guests at his tavern shaped J James Bell's political views, or on the other hand, if James Bell's views shaped the clientele who gathered there. Whether if James Bell was known as a rabid 
um, you know, rabid hater of British monarchy and a guy who was you know, extremely in favor of independence, if that affected the people who would come to his tavern, or whether he listened to these viewpoints and that shaped his own. But what we do know is pretty quickly that James Bell becomes a, what you would call a revolutionary. He was strongly in favor of independence by all accounts. And later in life, he became an anti-federalist, which Christine will fill, fill you on more. And as an anti-federalist, he opposed measures of the measures to um, increase the power of the federal government. He was also what we might know as a Jeffersonian. When it came to the election of Adams and Hamilton, or Adams and Jefferson, uh, James Bell was strongly in favor of Jefferson over President Adams. Uh, one of his associates was Robert Whitehill. Robert Whitehill, Robert Christ, who Christine mentioned, writes a lot about Robert Whitehill. Whitehill was a delegate in 1776 to the state constitutional convention forming a new, new constitution for the state of Pennsylvania after we declared independence. Whitehill is also known uh, by some historians as the father of the Bill of Rights. R Robert Whitehill is the man who drafts, uh, one of the men who at the Bell Tavern later will participate in discussions then he will go around as, some, as a quasi-national figure promoting a Bill of Rights, which eventually becomes in law the Bill of Rights. Uh, James Madison and other, uh, George Mason, took heavily, borrowed heavily from Robert Whitehill's ideals. Uh, Robert Whitehill's house still stands in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Now, Robert Whitehill was writing home from Philadelphia in June 1776. The letters from Robert Whitehill, the originals, are here in the archives. Um, to give you an idea, he was, just like James Bell, heavily in favor of independence. He wrote home on June 10, 1776, so about three weeks before the Declaration of Independence, that, quote, as a servant to the County of Cumberland, I think I would be a neglector of my duty to my constituents if I, if I did not take the earliest opportunity to warn them of their danger from a gentleman who hath been high in estimation in the county I am now representative of. Whitehill was talking about the debate for independence. He was talking particularly about John Dickinson, who was a delegate who was one of the people who was trying to obstruct at all costs um, the Declaration of Independence. He wanted um, to more conciliatory measures with Britain. And this is a quote from Whitehill saying, the expressions of John Dickinson's, Dickinson's in the House on the 7th of June, which I heard from his own mouth, confirm me in my opinion that he, with all the other delegates of this province and Congress, with him, designed to oppose and obstruct independence as he pledged himself to his honor. Now, Whitehill wrote at least two copies of almost the exact same letter, practically verbatim. Uh, this was a great example of how politics operated in the 18th century. And Robert Whitehill was seeking to inform his Cumberland County recipients uh, that a man, Dickinson, who they once respected, uh, was no longer deserving of that respect. And at the same time, Whitehill wanted to remind them that he was the one a proponent of independence. I'll turn it back to Christine now as she talks more about the tavern and how we get to 1788 and the Bill of Rights. It's 1788, and the Cumberland County is known as the back country. It is um, full of farmers and artisans. Um, pretty much the, the working class people that had little to say with, uh, have anything to do with the Constitution. When they would get um, the newspapers, it would, it would take weeks before they even got the newspapers. So in September, we got a new, September of 1787, we got a new um, con Constitution. And um, here it kind of like depicts a picture of Cumberland County, the early days. This is the earliest known sketch of Cumberland County. The little dots there would be considered the forest. So um, to, just to give you an idea, it was the frontier. And it was Lancaster County. Well, no, at that time it was actually Cumberland County. 1750 is whenever um, Cumberland County became its own. So and Cumberland County stretched all the way to Pittsburgh. So it was the frontier, okay? So in 1787, Pennsylvania, um, the delegates go to Philadelphia to ratify the United States Constitution. Prior to that, in October, 
Robert Whitehill, William Finley, John Smiley meet with George Mason, because George Mason refused to sign the U U.S. Constitution because it did not have a Bill of Rights. So whenever they met in Philadelphia, George Mason gave Whitehill a letter. Whitehill dictated a letter about his feelings about the Bill of Rights and so on. So, and what they wanted to do was actually have a second convention. So as they, as they um, went through and they tried, the Anti-Federalists tried to put off the ratification of the Constitution, but it didn't work because the Federalists, which were very um, prominent there in Philadelphia, and of course, um, you know, there was no representation except for Robert Whitehill, Finley, Smiley, um, for the back country, Cumberland County. And, and some of the other, uh, I have a, there's a map up there of what counties were there in, in, um, here in that period. So whenever they um, got to the ratification and the anti-federalists, they were actually drugged out of their inns, out of their rooms, they hid in Philadelphia because they did not want to participate in the ratification. Um, so then they, um, they were drugged out by the, uh, the federalists to attend the ratification. Well, the ratification ended up getting passed then on December 12th of 1787. But before that, according to the director of um, the study of the Constitution, the United States Constitution at the University of Wisconsin, um, what ended up happening, Benjamin Rush says to Robert White Whitehill, I thought you were gonna have a, have stand up and read Bill of Rights. Robert Whitehill said, well, I do, I want to. Benjamin Rush thought he, he, he would um, kind of do some bluffing or whatever there. He didn't think Robert Whitehill would have a Bill of Rights. Well, guess what? He had them and he stood up and read them. Soon he was shut down and because of the, the voting, the Federalists, um, out, they, there was more Federalists than the Anti-Federalists and they lost. So Pennsylvania ratified the United States Constitution against the desire of the Anti-Federalists. Because one thing the Anti-Federalists wanted was the consideration of the back country. So the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, they felt that the people did not have enough of rights the way the Constitution was. That's why they wanted the Bill of Rights. So they wanted the, the second um, convention. So what ended up happening, because of Pennsylvania being an example of the negativity of what could happen during a ratification, the other states made the Federalists promise to add a Bill of Rights. The, fe the Federalists said, okay, if you ratify the United States Constitution, I promise we will have a Bill of Rights in it. So, but during that time, Robert Whitehill drove his people together, and um, by June, only nine of the, tw of the 13 colonies had to approve in order for the Constitution to become law. So, what happened, then was um, by the end of June, there was actually 10 states. New, New Hampshire was the last one to ratify the Constitution. Well, Robert Whitehill pulled the Anti-Federalists together in Cumberland County and um, they, at the Bell Tavern where he, um, uh, where they had, where they wrote a circular letter um, to plan a convention um, on September 3rd in Harrisburg. And it was the only actual second convention um, there in, in the um, United States. So none of the other uh, states had a second convention. What I want, there's been some controversy as to what was discussed at the Bell Tavern. Um, Mary, do you wanna go ahead and go to the second page all the way down? Just to give you a little bit of proof as to, I'm gonna scroll down there. These are the minutes, what she is showing you here is the minutes from July 3rd, 1788. And if you read that there, that says draft of a letter circular on the United States, on the amendments of the United States Constitution. 
So what was actually discussed there was the amendments for the United States Constitution. And I also want to express, according to the University of Wisconsin director for the study of the history of the, of the United States Constitution, um, six of our Bill of Rights is in our current, six of the uh, Bill of Rights that Whitehill wrote is in our Constitution today. Six of the 10 was written by Whitehill. So, and um, Cooper's gonna go ahead and read some of what was, some of those minutes. So you can see that uh, Mary's been showing a couple of the different pages here. Uh, let me just read a couple excerpts from it. It says, East Pensborough, Cumberland County, July 3rd, 1788. In a meeting of delegates, that's an important word, delegates, they consider themselves delegates of different townships of Cumberland County coming together. In a meeting of delegates from the several townships of said county at Mr. James Bell's, Benjamin Blythe in the chair, assembled for the purpose of advising the most eligible mode of obtaining such amendments to the proposed Constitution of these United States as may remove the causes of jealousy and, and commercial atrocity, the foundation appears to be laid in the parts of, parts of the said Constitution. Uh, it was resolved that in the, opini the opinion of the meeting, the Constitution prepared by the late General Convention, meaning the Constitution of the United States, for the government of the United States is, in several parts, destructive of that liberty, of that liberty, for which securing so much beloved, so much blood and treasure have have been shed, and sub, and subversive of the several state governments by which the rights and liberties of the citizens have been guarded and secured, that it is indisp the indispensable duty of every citizen to use all lawful means to obtain such amendments in the said Constitution as shall be judged necessary for securing religion and liberty. Religion and liberty sound a lot like the fir First Amendment. It was also resolved that in the opinion of the meeting, it will be expedient to collect, as soon as accurately as possible, the sentiment of the people of each county within this commonwealth, respecting such amendments as shall be judged most, ex most agreeable, and such mode be done proper for obtaining such amendments. Uh, and I want to read from the back here, talking about some of the names of the people who were there. It was resolved that Benjamin Blythe, John Loudon, James Powers, William Stewart, and Robert Whitehill. Um, those, were, those were some of the names. Benjamin Blythe was chair. A lot of these people, uh, Benjamin Blythe, Robert Whitehill, of course, were very prominent people within the county. And they met at Bell Tavern. In, in a, what was a very decidedly political move. They knew James Bell was friendly to their cause. They knew he was an anti-federalist. And as Christine will talk about, he actually got thrown in jail for it uh, about 10 years after this was uh, t this taken place. But it shows the fact that James Bell's tavern was the meeting place for a county, county delegation, shows that um, James Bell was a well-respected and um, known ally to the anti-federalist movement. Uh, his service in the Revolution and his later arrest under the uh, Alien Sedition Acts show that he had, was pretty consistent in his principles. Um, the other thing that we want to just go over here quickly is the, one of the more remarkable things. James Bell would remain at Stony Ridge. He remained there for the rest of his life. And in 1806, the Cumberland Register of Carlisle will print his obituary. It says, died at Stony Ridge in East Pemsbury Township. Mr. James Bell, an old and respectable inhabitant of that place. Right below his notice of his death, we sincerely congratulate our readers on the return of Captains Lewis and Clark from an important and arduous enterprise. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you a date. As this man's life was coming to a close, so was the mission of Lewis and Clark. That kind of gives you a perspective of the time period we are in. Let's get back to Christine. Thank you. Moving on now um, to 1798. James Bell was a true patriot. And um, one of the things that in 1798 was the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act, which let me read the caption here, a fight, it, this is actually a fight in Congress. The, the image appeared in Harper's New 
monthly magazine nearly a century after the incident between Lyon and Griswold with the poetic caption, he in a trice struck Griswold thrice, upon his head engaged, sir. Who sees the tongs to ease his wrongs? And Griswold thus engaged her. So they started to fight over this, the Sedition Act. Let me just read to you um, what the Sedition Act was. It was the most controversial of new laws permitting strong government control over individual actions. In essence, the act prohibited public opposition to the government. Fines and imprisonment could be used against those who write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, malicious writing against the government. Under the terms of this law, over 20 Republican newspaper editors were arrested and some were imprisoned. The most dramatic victim of the law was Representative Matthew Lyon of Vermont. So, um, so that gives you an idea of what it was, you know, what happened. Then appearing in the um, Boston Independent Chronicle, on, which is interesting, July 3rd, 1798, the prosecution of James Bell is reported to have occurred while the Sedition Act was still under consideration by, con by the Congress. The accounts in two Maryland newspapers and the Boston Independent Chronicle are elliptical, and details of the nature of the case are lacking. It is not even clear whether the case was brought under the Act, federal criminal law, or even the state common law. From accounts, it appears that James Bell of Stony Ridge, Pennsylvania, was apprehended on a warrant for treasonable expression in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He was arraigned before William Levis and James McCormick, Esquire, and bound over on the um, reconnaissance of $600. Unfortunately, further details of the proceedings are lacking. So there's no, no more. So what this is saying is that James Bell, the patriot that he was, I mean, he fought for independence, he stood up against the government, and because he did that, uh, he was arrested for treason. Um, one of the uh, things, you know, um, when it goes to the First Amendment, you know, right there is the First Amendment. Um, then as uh, Cooper touched a little bit then, on uh, James Bell's son, Thomas. After James Bell had died, um, his son, Thomas, took over the tavern. And what is interesting, his son applied, when he applied for his tavern license, after the death of his father, he wanted it signed with a rattlesnake. Now, the rattlesnake was representative of the Revolutionary War, which actually originated with Ben Franklin during the French and Indian War. But then it was, um, I don't know if any of you had seen the Don't Tread on Me. Well, that was actually um, from the Revolutionary War. And um, so it's interesting that um, Thomas, his son Thomas then changed it to the son of the rattlesnake. <coughs> from there we're gonna move on to um, Captain Joel Smith Sponsler. Um, there we go. Okay, right. Yep. This is this is Joel Smith <coughs> Sponsler. Captain Joel Smith Sponsler, a Scotch Irish origin, born on February sixteenth, eighteen thirty-seven, in Mahoning County, Ohio. He moved to Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, when he was just ten years old. He received a common school education. On July 19, 1856, he married Miss Annie Dahl, daughter of John and Mary Dahl Groover of Franklin County, Pennsylvania. Joe and Annie had eight children. John, born October 23, 1856. Sally Jane, born June 12, 1858. Molly Grover, born March 2, uh, 1862. These three died. <coughs> in 1862, imagine that. I mean, can you imagine losing all your children the same year? And they believe it may have been either because of uh, smallpox or typhoid. 
William Smith, born September 1863, Annie Kate, born June 15, 1866, Robert Parker, born 1868, George, born 1827, uh, I'm sorry, March 27, 1870, and Julia M., born May 2, 1873. <coughs> On September 15, 1862, Joel Smith sponsor, which he actually went by the name of Smith, and that seems to be a, general, uh, a generational um, following, um, we have his, one of his descendants here. Smith's sponsor enlisted in Company F, 17th Regiment, Regiment, Pennsylvania Cavalry. He left his quiet home, wife, and small children to fight the battles of his country, went to the front, and served with honor to, clo to the close of the war. His regiment, the famous 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry, was one of those which won imperishable renown, and its gallant deed are memorialized on every field of battle from the Rappahannock to the James and in all the battles, total 57, in which his regiment engaged. Smith's sponsor was present among Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Winchester, Appomattox, and the wilderness were the most prominent. Captain Sponsor had three horses shot out from under him during the war and was dragged across a battlefield on another occasion. This, this man, you know, he's just amazing. It is not known if he was wounded by one account, um, by one account from his, by one account from his records indicates he was carried off a battlefield. He was promoted for gallant services from his sergeant, second lieutenant on May 22nd, to second lieutenant, second lieutenant on May 25th, 1863. Lieutenant and Captain March, and then to Captain March 8th, 1864. He was mustered out June 20th, 1865 at Clouds Mills, <coughs> Virginia. After the close of the war, Captain Sponsor returned to Cumberland County and settled down to a peaceful pursuit of farming and having the largest horse farm in Cumberland County after the war. His pistols from the war were lost in a fire, perhaps at the tavern he lived in, Silver Spring Township, and remained on the farm for 20 years. He was well known throughout the county as an honorable and industrious man. He was a Republican in politics. Captain Sponsor died November 17, 1920. His wife, Annie, passed away August 27, 1914. They were both buried in Latour Cemetery in Carlisle. One of the, um, on their grave, the, the epitaph is um, Forget-Me-Nots. And this is a, um, has to do with a poem that was written. And um, do you want to go? What we have, okay, go ahead. This is the poem that was handwritten, and uh, my understanding is not sure who who wrote it, but um, it could have been Captain Sponsor to his wife or vice versa, the Forget Me Not poem that was handwritten. So on the tombstone, it says Forget Me Not, which, um, you wanna go to the tombstone there and we can see that? As you can see down there, you can see the forget-me-not. Okay. So moving on, um, at the there residence. were residents, several residents, and in the research, it was interesting to find out that um, from this, oh, that, that is Captain Sponsor's watch, which uh, um, one of his heirs had. And I understand, too, there was a picture of a sword. Somebody has his saber. So um, this is um, Sharon and Smitty Nybert, who are the descendants of um, Captain Sponsler. Um, but uh, it, it, what, what is interesting, what, what I have found, or what we have found through the research, is that after the Bells had it, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but then a sponsor had it. And then something else happened, and the Bells had it again in 1903. So
Somewhere down the road, the sponsors ended up getting it again, which the um, Sundays can attest to. Um, they knew of a, of a Smith sponsor that had it. Isn't, isn't that correct? There was a Smith sponsor there, Mr. Sunday? Yeah, Smith, my dad bought it from Smith. Yeah, and that was about what year? 1947. So the sponsors lived there then, a Smith sponsor then. Smith so it's, oh, it's his, his, it was the grandfather. So, so you see how it's just really interesting how the tavern has, has lasted through these families and the history. So, um, and then I have a couple other families. The, after uh, the sponsors and the Sundays had it. Let's go. There to the Sundays. Now the Sundays lived there um, from 1947 all through. And here's the various pictures. This, of course, is Dolores and is this Kirk? Or Craig. Craig, okay, your oldest, correct? Yes. And this would be in the front room. If you're looking at the tavern um, towards the North Mountain, this would be on the right. This is the right room. The brick fireplace is still there and is still intact. So, and then this is some of the outside from when they were living there. And the back part where you can see more of the L shaped there, the additional part that was there. And then these stairs. Amazingly, would you believe these stairs have survived the demolition? Isn't that great? And there's the fireplace. And that is Dolores and out the back part. And there's the steps again. Which is, um, yes, Linda, Linda Sunday Chesky's here. She, she grew up there too. This is the kitchen. That's the Sunday clan right there. Okay, that's all the Sundays. Okay. And then this is, I guess, the living room? Yeah. So this just gives you an idea how, how, you know, it was a home. I mean, it was a tavern. It welcomed people for years, and then it became a home, a family home and a farm. This is a shed here, and this is a corn crib, and this is the back part of the house here. And this is the back part, right? <coughs> I think we found that door. I think Kevin. <laughs> so trying to put faces to the tavern, I mean, it's not just a stone building or a cold stone building on a hill. There's value to, to the, the building and it has stories. And we're losing too many of these buildings in Cumberland County. And um, it was once eligible for the National Registry. Unfortunately, it never made it there and it ended up where it's at today. So, um, do you wanna go to the stabilization pictures? So stabilization, the stabilization of the tavern has started. And this is where we're at. Kevin Hollowell is here. He was the one um, that is doing the stabilization. So I'm gonna go ahead and let him speak to these. We do have some artifacts up here that you were uh, free to uh, peruse um, in this. So um, I'll let uh, Kevin then do, um, give detail of, of what he's found and what, what's going on. It's interesting to hear all this political situation about this tavern and the distrust of the federal government. It's funny how things come around in circles nowadays. <laughs> um, I was contracted, I restore old buildings. I worked on Randy's tavern and I was contracted to, at this point, just shore up the building and stabilize it. Uh, we looked it over pretty heavily and, and thought that it wouldn't take a whole lot of uh, stabilization, obviously it's, it's holding up pretty well even to some of the strong winds we've had lately, but there was quite a big pile of, uh, do you have a picture of the back? <coughs> there was quite a pile of rubble left by the, the demolition machines. Oh. 
not there. Lean again, uh, against the building itself, <coughs> and it took us a day and a half to pick through it. I wanted to pick through uh, slow enough that we didn't miss any architectural pieces, any trim pieces that could, if not uh, be used in the restoration in the future, or at least give us something to duplicate, a pattern to duplicate from. That's a picture of the uh, hand slit latch and the handmade nails that's throughout the building. The plaster is actually uh, mostly mud and straw. That's underneath the uh, basement stairway. Um, that's how the plaster was applied. The, the thick coat, the scratch coat they call it, was put on and then they scraped it with a rake type comb to put those lines in it so that the finished plaster would stick to it. And it's interesting, it makes some pretty interesting designs throughout all the old plaster that we're pulling out. There's part of what we, that's the, the grand staircase, right? Uh, that we saw, I guess that was the beginning of yesterday, or two days ago, Tuesday when we started working on this. Uh, most of the pieces are inside the house in the front room right now. We were able to take most of the landings and some of the steps and the uh, railings and and secure them. There's some more pictures of the interesting plaster work. Um, after we dug through the big pile of debris that the, the bulldozer left, and we salvaged probably two thirds of the, the hand hewn floor joist and the, some of the trim. And we realized that what's left of the back uh, on the kitchen side was being held up by two two by fours. It wasn't put in there, the walls weren't put in there to actually hold the building. They were there inside the stone walls. So when the stone walls were torn out, all this left is this small skeleton on the inside. And most of the two by fours on the east side had been broken by the bulldozer. So there was only two of them in the corner that were actually holding anything. So we quickly put up a couple uh, walls inside just to hold things together. And uh, the roof was, so back up, back up one there. I want to talk about those. Beautiful uh, built-in cupboards with the scallop shelves. They're all original. We found the doors. Uh, some of them are pieces, but some of them were, we found the, two of them in the attic. Oh. And one in the basement uh, with the T-strap hinges on them. And uh, almost all the, the woodwork is original, and it's all put together with some, you will see some of the handmade nails. They're, they're in everything that we're, we're pulling apart now. Um, what's left standing in the front is pretty secure. It's, there are 20 inch thick stone walls, so it's, uh, it's holding up and it's, it, once we get it buttoned up and, and close it in and out of the elements, I think it'll stand for a while until they can decide what they're going to do with it. So if anybody has any questions about the current status of the house, I can answer any of the the structural or construction aspect of it. Yes, sir. If it's going to be rebuilt, the stone is going to be <coughs> thick, like 20 inch thick walls. Uh, reuse the stones. Can you get them to put semblance of their original order or just uh, start? There's the probably <laughs> enough there because if they just concentrate on the original rectangular building, the stones that were on the addition are still usable also. But one of the problems is. When they tore the back addition down, they piled up the stones so that they could move their heavy equipment on top of it so that they could reach the top rafters of the house and smash down through. And so a lot of the stones from the addition have been turned into gravel right now. So, But underneath, I think there's still a lot of stone. And for some reason, they pulled, I guess they were thinking about salvage, all the big cornerstones are buried in a pile off to the side. So we have quite a few of the original cornerstones too. But so, so what you're describing, they not only knocked stuff down, but started moving them around. Yeah. So the order of stones you can't infer from what's left. It's not like just no, the ground and stay there. No, we couldn't, we couldn't put it back exactly, but we could, uh, and, and even in the backs, if we just <coughs> concentrated on the rectangular original building, um, all we have is pic our pictures with the L on it. So we'll have to improvise with what we can 
see in the structure as to what windows might and doors might have been on the side that was eventually built onto. But this side is the worst because half of the chimney, I'm, I'm surprised the chimney is still up there, but it's, it's pretty massive, but half the chimney has gone. Um, and it's, we uncovered the foundation today. We uncovered, actually, there's still a heart intact underneath all the rubble. And uh, the beautiful in the basement, beautiful four huge stone supports under, the, under the, every single fireplace. So, yeah, well, they changed it from date stone. The what? Date stone. The 1870. Didn't see any date stones in it. No. Well, we're not done picking through, though. <laughs> you can come out and look for it. <laughs> any, any chance that the, the uh, brick was done on the site? There's not much brick. There isn't? No, not very much at all. Uh, only some of the bricks that were in the hearth, and, and surprisingly, when they built the walls, they usually... They build an outside skin and an inside skin, and they throw rubble in between. And there's some bricks tossed in there, but very little brick in this at all. Um, we found a lot of the hearth bricks, and we've got them stacked up in the side. So there, there were also um, some remnants. There was some talk about a, a log cabin being there. Um, do you want to? Talk a little about the, the remnants of the log. We found a piece of a, a very primitive piece of a door frame that somebody had hand carved a, a beadwork across it, and it looked to me like the outside of a, an old post and lentil door frame. Did not belong to this house, but what they did is when they were building the stone walls on the inside, they would embed pieces of junk timbers or whatever they had into the wall so that they had something to nail their trim work onto later on. And it was being used as a nailer block, but it's a interesting piece of wood and it's one of the most interesting finds we had. That's a, the back side of one of the built-in cupboards that uh, unfortunately got pulled apart. I think I have 90% of that in pieces in the corner, so if anybody really likes puzzles, they can come out and try their hand at it. Uh, the, there's enough of the, of the building left in the front that all the architectural details are there, so you can really, it wouldn't be hard to piece it back together as far as authenticity. Randy, why did it withstand with all the weather we had and all the all of those snowstorms, you know, the wind, and what, what is your, what is, do you think the reason was? That it well, these were made with, basically the mortar is almost like dirt but it's very uh, soft and it's resilient. Mm -hmm. And that's why these older buildings are still standing when a lot of the newer ones are cracking. I mean, even you, you move into a new house and about two years later you see cracks through the walls because everything's rigid. This stuff is built to move and flex a little bit. And that's why it's very difficult to use modern materials on old buildings because they don't have the resiliency a lot of times and, and it'll just do more damage than it'll help. And plus the 20 inch thick walls really help. And the timbers they use are massive. They're just not particle board or, or wafer board. These, these are, the, the floor joists are nine inch by four inch. So. And you have a time limit? The what? Do you have a time limit? Yes. A lot of it is um, hemlock. There's a little bit, all the, the lath is all split oak, hand split oak. Um, there's a lot of yellow pine, which in, in a lot of cases, this old long standing stuff was standing when the white man came across and when they cut it down, it's as hard as, it's as, hard as oak, the yellow pine. And even today, after 200 some years, you can smell the sap. It smells like you just cut it down. No, no mahogany. <laughs>
is one of the safe rooms. Um, we are hoping that once stabilization takes effect, we can get in there and start to trim those uh, layers of paint off and get down to that writing and see what it says. That's one thing that's interesting. Before the demolition took place, uh, <coughs> there was a salvager who was allowed to go inside, uh, took some of the fireplace mantles, took uh, floorboards out. Uh, we've located those and we're going to try to get those back. So that's just some of the things um, that it's a bright spot when you see half of a building gone. Uh, another thing is, is one thing we're, we, we have a uh, we're lucky to be in such a Pennsylvania forest. We have salvagers that are around here. There are salvagers that salvage only this period of material. So finding correct period material doesn't mean we have to go to New York, Maryland. It's right here. It's right in the area. So that won't be a problem. Thanks, Rupert. I have a question. How long has it been decided whether to restore it, build it? Where is it now? I mean, how is this before? Yeah, I can tell you for a fact that we don't own it. We don't own it. I can tell you for a fact that we want to save it. Yeah, sure. Um, there are negotiations going on right now. Uh, there are three entities that involved. Um, in six to eight weeks, we'll know which direction we're heading. And we'll have a, a, a final opinion. I know that the yeah. cost is extremely high as anticipated. <laughs> Um, that cost could go even higher depending on how these negotiations go. Um, doesn't mean it can't be done. We have um, SME, subject, subject matter experts on hand on the committee who are good at getting grants. Uh, we're going to start that as soon as we know the exact direction we're going. Right now the owner is allowed us to go in and uh, stabilize the project. He's uh, even allowed uh, Dixon College to come in and maybe do a sample of the wood. What that is, is you just take a piece of the one you think is one of the oldest pieces of wood there, and it'll take and carbon date it, and then we can get an exact period of when the tower was built. <coughs> we have probably the number one expert in metals in the area right here, sitting back in the corner back there. If you look at the nails that they're pulling out, he can tell you the world about that nails, and you can get pretty darn close to uh, the air, but we still don't know the exact date that this house is built. We we speculate, but knowing the exact date would be really good for us. I have a question. Sure. Um, I'm going because I did read the article in the paper, but... Which page? Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to read the article in the paper. Well, the first one, not the one I'm not sure where it was torn to pieces, but the Well, the damage is down to 
There is a map here for you to look at from 1758, or I'm sorry, um, 1858. It gives you an idea of what it looked like. Okay, and um, all the way down. It has the old tavern on here, and then the Samuel Musselman Farm, which is part of that, which ended up buying it. So, so there is a map where you can look at them too. One of the other things 
Um, we have a website for anybody who does the computers. Um, it is patriotsofcapitalstavern.com, and there you can read about the, the tavern. You can also do donations through the internet, um, through through um, credit card with credit card. The other thing is, no, GoFundMe is no. We are any donations are tax deductible right now because we are working with Preservation Pennsylvania, 013C. We got ten thousand dollars from a gentleman in Colorado. He and his wife, wife are willing to raise money for the town, and they're in Colorado. Okay. So what I have here is a pledge form. Okay. Um, I, I I hate. I don't like asking for money. So, um, but. If you feel that this is a good cause, you don't necessarily need to give. All you would have to do is just pledge and and mail it to us. And then if the tavern is saved, we will contact you. Okay. Um, or if you want to go ahead and donate, right now we have eleven thousand dollars, eleven thousand forty dollars in the, you know. And, and right now what we're looking at to restore the tavern is. Um, is what what did you say, Randy? You were thinking it was four four hundred four hundred thousand around. Four hundred thousand is startup cost. Yeah, to, that's to put the back wall on. Okay, what was demolished? Okay. So I'm not going to hand these out. I'm just going to put them up here. These pledge forms, whoever feels. The other thing is, um, you want to hand me? Real quick, guys. Cooper, stand up real quick. Yeah. Cooper, tell everybody how old you are. 17. 17 years old. Um, Cooper has published books on the Civil War. He is, if you purchase one of his books, he will donate. We'll donate the half the proceeds. He will donate to, half of it to the tower. Okay? The other thing we have is a limited edition, say we only have 48 of them, and they come in small, medium, large, and extra large for $20. Um, save the Bell Tavern on the front and on the back. You have what was part of the minutes from 1788 and our website. Cooper, what are your books about? Uh, one is on the Confederate invasion of Carlisle and the West Shore, and the other one is on uh, uh, Harrisburg, Camp Curtin, etc. So there's Cumberland County and Harrisburg.